Father, thank you for your love and mercy. Thank you for the joy. We look forward to being together, to celebrating, to communing. And today, God, as we open your word, help us to see your nature just a little more clearly. I pray that in Christ's holy name and all that agree say, amen. I'm going to ask you to get your Bibles out and open to the, sec 20, the 20th chapter, not the second, but the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. And we're going to start our study there and work through a few words that Paul gave through tears to some people that he loved. The preschool class had come to the point in the summer when they were going to do water painting, watercolors, finger painting. And so the rule was that you could have one color at a time. And you could paint with that one color. And when you wanted another color, you had to come back over and ask for that other color because they didn't want to mess when the day was over. So Sue came over and she got yellow to paint a nice big sun. Bobby came over and he got the brown and worked on a horse. Billy got the black and decided he'd do a big spider. But Jerry kept coming over for different colors. Red, blue, orange, yellow, purple. And as the teachers looked, he was just, just going all over his little piece of paper with them and coming back just within a moment after he'd smear another color on. And the teacher walked over and said, Jerry, what is it you're painting? He said, I am painting God. And she said, well, that's interesting. Um, Jerry, we don't know, nobody knows what God looks like without Blinking and I, he grabbed another color and said, well, they will when I'm done, and just kept going at it. That's the goal of every preacher, I guess, and Bible class teacher ever. I would love to paint for you this morning the nature of God. That was the goal, I believe, of the scripture writers. And so they employed adjective after adjective to answer this question. What is God like? Powerful, almighty, just, faithful, loving, compassionate, present, everlasting, holy. I mean, you could just rattle off adjective after adjective, and we've sung them, and we've studied them, but the last few weeks have brought another adjective to the top of that list that may have been somewhere on there, but I don't remember using God is generous. The most quoted verse in all of the New Testament. Anybody want to take a wild guess what the most quoted verse in all the New Testament is? For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. The first verb there, for God so loved that his desire for, for, for us prompted him to give. You see, we have a generous God, a God who gave in an astounding way, a God who gave so much. Well, I read the other day, I wish I could claim these as mine, but I can't. God, someone said, is the world's greatest giver. He had the greatest capacity to give. Can I get an oh yeah? yeah. You think anybody's got a bigger bank account than God? Yeah. You think anybody's got more to give than God does? He had the greatest capacity to give. He had the most powerful motivation to give. There's no more powerful motivation than love. He faced the greatest need of all, and that is the lostness of all mankind, and he gave the greatest gift of all, his son, because he loves us so. Jesus taught that we have the ability to join with God in living a life of generosity. And one of the most powerful teachings of Jesus is one of the very few, in fact, it may be the only teaching of Jesus that you can't find in Matthew or Mark or Luke or John. Now, for those of you who know your Bible, you're saying, wait a minute, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're the four Gospels. They're the one that teach about Jesus in his life. So where do you find a teaching that isn't in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Everybody turn to Acts chapter 20, if you haven't gotten there yet, and take a look, beginning in verse 32. Paul is saying goodbye on the seashore at Miletus to the elders from Ephesus that he loved dearly. And he starts this way. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, 
which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Before we go any farther, understand Paul knows a couple of things that are breaking his heart. First, he knows that he's not going to see these guys again. Now, he doesn't die quite as quickly as I think Paul might have thought he was going to die as he's heading back to face the governor, heading back ultimately to face the ruler in Rome. But Paul wants these men to know, if I never see you again, know this. I get out to California, try to, at least a couple of times a year. And I was touched by one of our church family who said, one of the things I'm doing for this initiative is I'm forestalling a trip. And, and it may be a trip that would mean I wouldn't see those folks again. That's huge to me. That's a huge sacrifice. Because I have found myself with my relatives in California when I see them thinking, what if this were it? What if this is the last time I could hug my nephew Brett or say to Brooke, now, work hard in school. Or say to Carissa, who's thinking about getting married, think long and hard. Because this is huge. Can I get it? Oh, yeah, this is huge. But I've known him two months, Uncle Jeff. Think long and hard. Or to my sister. Or to my brother. Most of you know that a year... And a couple of months ago, I got on a plane and flew home thinking that I would be able to celebrate with my mother and at her birthday in January. And that wasn't God's plan. And that's okay because she's with Jesus. And it's better than any birthday party. But I think, did I say what I wanted to say? Would I have taken her by the shoulders one more time and said, Mom, I just, you, you, you've been so good to me. Well, Paul had the chance because he knew this is it. What would you say if you were looking into a loved one's eye and had one more moment to say, can I tell you one thing? Paul finishes up with two things. This is first the part of it. Now I commit you to God and the word. Let's read it together. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And look what he continues with. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. Wait a minute, time out. I'm really loving this speech as it starts. I commit you to God and the word of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance. Paul is pointing them towards heaven. He's saying God loves you and he's forgiven you and one day you'll be with him forever and I can see these elders in Ephesus and I can see the tears on their faces and I can hear Paul's voice breaking and then with the next sentence he seems to take a big left turn and say, now listen, I want you guys to know I wasn't greedy. What? Well, I haven't coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You know yourselves that these hands of mine supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. What, 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 Paul, did you get all defensive on us? Did you just change subjects? And then Paul drops this gem in their laps that you won't find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Take a look at how it continues. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we need to help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Well, there it is. You think, what an interesting kind of one-two combo he does there. I point you to God's grace that will build you up in the sanctified, and oh, by the way, live a generous life. Are these two disconnected? I want to unpack this for you in a way that surprised me as I was led to look at this text again because they are not only not disconnected, these two are beautifully woven together by the Spirit as Paul was moved to say this is what you need to know before you go. First, I commit you to God and the word of his grace. Paul's powerful love for God's grace is natural. He knows that we have a tendency to wander into self-sufficiency. Paul's love for God's grace comes out of his own experience 
of God's grace. Everybody remember what Paul's name was before it was Paul? What was it? Saul. And most know that Saul means the great one, and that's who he saw himself as. But he was not simply someone puffed up with his own pride. He was someone so convinced of his own rightness that he was putting in prison and beating and, yes, even killing Christians in order to stamp out Christianity. Now, I've had some people come to me over the years and been part of churches where folks who have joined have had some pretty colorful background. I've known fantastic believers. In fact, got a piece of mail from one just yesterday and spotted that name and it triggered it. I remember when he went to prison. It was an embezzling case. He was a minister. And it was one of those moments when everybody just went, oh, no. You know, the, the, kind, of, the kind of news that some people want to grab and trumpet. And I knew this guy and he was a good-hearted guy. And he just, well, sin is tempting. If it weren't, it wouldn't be so popular. Amen. He just, he just got tempted and he sinned and he got caught and he paid the price and he got out of prison. And when he got out of prison, he dedicated his life to service and he's continued to serve for many years. But can you be honest? When I see him, one of the things that hits my mind is what? That's that guy that went to prison. I know, I know. Love keeps no record of wrongdoing. But I could name certain names in the public arena. And as soon as I name them, certain things immediately come to mind. There are politicians and rock stars and comedians whose names will forever be linked to the darkest moment. And isn't that sad? Wouldn't you rather you link them to the best moment? Instead of somebody saying Pee Wee Herman and, oh boy, something comes to mind, right? And probably not a lot of the humor, but maybe that, oh yeah. Just like when I, when I, when I saw that minister's name on that piece of, of mail, I immediately, and he's a great guy, but I thought, oh yeah, I remember that. Now think about Paul. His wasn't just, well, he embezzled some money. Or he mistreated someone. Or even, well, you know, he told a lie and was caught in it. Or he cheated on a spouse. No, no. Paul was, there's that guy that killed people because they believed in Jesus. I envision Paul at some kind of, I don't know, gathering in a city where he's speaking. I see him as an old man stepping up. To the podium or or standing in front of the house group as he begins to speak and everyone's crowding around because they know this is paul this is the one that met jesus and as he finishes this presentation and as he tells the gospel story and as people come up and say would you baptize me and i believe paul would say no i won't but this person here will at one point he says i'm kind of glad i didn't baptize many of you because paul didn't want them connected to him and so as as he's as he's talking to people after this visit there's someone waiting at the back of the crowd who waits until almost everyone else has spoken and they walk up and they say, I just wanted to look you in the eyes. You helped stone my mother. And I'm so glad to see you're a believer now. What do you think Paul thought about when he laid down that night? The 15 or 30 or 100 that said, I want to give my life to Jesus. Or that one voice saying, you killed my mom. Is it any wonder that Paul would write, I don't deserve to be called an apostle. But man, it's by the grace of God that I stand here. So the last thing out of his mouth to these men is, get God's grace. Can you say that with me? Get God's grace, which is God, God's, pardon me, uh, a God's riches at Christ's expense. Riches for us, great riches. That's what grace is. It is God's riches given to us at Christ's expense. And he says, get God's grace and wrap your arms around that because if you do, it will help you with one of the great battles all human fight. And that's selfishness and greed. What does it have to do with the rest of the story? I believe what Paul gives us is the ability to deal with what Jesus said was one of the most challenging temptations of all. Jesus makes this statement. 
He says, watch out for all kinds of greed. It's interesting that he says that in the book of Luke. Be on your guard. Watch out for it. Now, that watch out language is the language that a commander in the Roman army would call to his soldier if there was someone coming up from the rear. Watch out. Look out. Look behind you. That's the sense of it. And when Jesus calls out to his disciples, it says, watch out. It's sneaking up on you. I, I, I pondered on that. I love the words Tim Keller had to say about it. He said, I believe that greed is sneaky because nobody thinks they're greedy. You know, when you steal something, it's kind of hard to miss. You just stole. When you tell a lie, even if you want to diminish it, you know you lied. If you're involved with someone that you're not married to, nobody has to explain to your heart, well, you've been involved in sexual sin. But when's the last time you were greedy? When's the last time I was greedy? Greedy's kind of gray, you know? I ordered dessert. Was that really greedy? I bought the next one up TV. Was that greed? I, I, I managed to save a little this way so I could spend a little that way, and it was spent on me and my family. How do you know? Where's the bright red line? And the problem is, there isn't one. Greed can become one of those quiet lifestyles, one of those things that we wrestle with, and it's so hard to spot. So how do you fight it? Well, I believe generosity is the only antidote for greed. It's an antidote that you take. Well, actually, it's an antidote you give instead of take, isn't it? Because when I am generous, it opens my hands and allows me to remember who gave me everything. So how do you promote generosity? I know how we do it with our kids. They've got the bag full of candy. And the little neighbor boy comes over. And they're sitting on the front step eating the candy. And then everybody says, hi, what you eating? And mama is watching from the door. And finally, she says, what? Aren't you going to? Yeah, the S word. Exactly. Share. What a beautiful word for an ugly concept as a child, right? <laughs> Share means get ripped off. Share means I can't have it all. Share means, oh, man. And wouldn't you love to believe it's just kids that struggle with that? Oh, when's the last time you're eating with someone you love? And you look down and they had one piece of pie left. One slice of one piece. And they'd gotten up to do something and you thought, man, that's good. And you'd said, I'm not going to have any pie because... You know, I'm cutting back. And your fork sneaks across the table. <laughs> it's just a bite. And from the sink you hear, don't even think about it. I was saving that bite. That bite's got all the extra cream on it. That bite's got the, the topping. Don't even touch it. I'm afraid I've done that. When's the last time you found yourself breaking the cookie and trying to break it exactly in half? What, what part of us is that that goes all the way back to the little boy sitting on the stoop with the candy? It's the part that says, oh, I might miss out. If I give this to you, then, then I won't have it. It's the part that Satan spoke to when he said to the woman, hey, you want to be like God? All you got to do is take that. But God said I'm not so, oh, don't worry about that. You don't want to miss out, do you? It's how kids get involved in drugs, and it's how adult get, gets involved in extramarital affairs. It's how people get lured into addiction, and it's how people get lied into embezzlement. Because we think, oh, man, is this my chance? I don't want to miss it. Maybe I should take it. And that voice inside of us says, you deserve it. That's your cookie. That's your candy. And then for somebody to stick out their hand and say, can I have some of yours? Paul says to these elders before he leaves them, don't forget who gave you 
everything you've got. That's what grace is. The Hebrew word uh, chan or chanan, depending on how you pronounce it, is the word for generous and gracious. It's the same word from which we get grace that gives us salvation. Is the same word from which we get generous, which is being generous with someone. God is gracious. You know that scripture or that, that verse that gives us the great song? And the Lord be gracious, gracious unto you. With a sevenfold amen following it. That's the word for generous. What we're singing is, may God be generous to you. Now, how many of us can say God has been generous to me? Can I get a oh yeah? He's been generous to me in my salvation. He's been generous to me in my life. And Paul says, if you get a hold of that, it'll make you a generous person. Oh, you can have mama say, now share. And sometimes, quite frankly, preachers can feel like that when we get up. All right, we got this initiative coming and you need to be generous. Why? Well, do you want to go to hell or heaven? You need to be generous. Share. I know you don't want to, but share. Sometimes I, I feel like that even myself. That may get you to do it for a moment, but it isn't any fun. Amen? There's no joy in that. Others would say, oh, you need to show the need. So we'll put up pictures of needy people or we'll show pictures of the hurting and needy when we're trying to have a missions contribution for Haiti or Honduras. And somebody says, oh, look, I want to give because of that need. Now, that's called feeling giving. You know, you can have forced giving or feeling giving. Forced giving is open your wallet, Brad, and stick it in because you know it's right. Feeling giving is, oh, Jane, did you see those little kids and what they don't have and what they need? And Jane, who's got a heart three times as big as hers should be, says, oh, my goodness, Gary, what can we do? Yeah, I can force giving or I can move to feeling giving. But Paul says, how about we talk about grace giving? That's when nobody is forcing me and nobody's trying to tug on my heartstrings. Although God's command to give and the blessing of giving are both true. But instead, Paul says to these guys, do you remember how I lived? What are you saying, Paul? Do you remember how I lived? You remember that I, I wasn't greedy? Do you remember that I wasn't unwilling to share and work hard? He said, do you know why I was that way? It wasn't because of me. It was because of how good God has been to me. For when God is generous to me, I am moved to generosity with others. When God is generous to me, I am moved to generosity with others. Amen? Amen. So how generous has God been to you? Wow. Wow. He has been awfully gracious to me. You know, there are some things on which it is easy for me to spend money on. How about you? I've got a friend who can't, he, he never met a book he shouldn't buy. <laughs> He's got a library that's going out of style. I'm a gadget guy. My wife knows. She had to take the keys when they bring out things like the new iPad. Don't even think about it. You don't need it. But gadgets call out to me. And I got reflecting the other day, why? Why do I love getting that cool new thing? You realize what it is? It's the same reason my buddy buys books, and it's the same reason some of you never met a new skirt or a new jacket that you didn't think belonged to you. It's the same reason some of us just enjoy shopping. Because it tells me something about myself that I want to believe. See, when I'm the guy whipping out the cool new phone, I'm cool. And having had three sons who have tried to tell me, no, you're not. I keep, I keep bringing out, no, but look here. I've got the cool new gadget and I know the cool new thing. What is it for you when you put on the dress? Is it when you drive the car? Is it when you're able to drop the address of your house on somebody? Yeah, we live over in that part of town. Or maybe when you just say, oh, yes, I've been to that country. Oh, my goodness. We traveled there and we enjoyed it. We all do it. It's part of building up this little identity of trying to say who I am and present myself. And Paul says, Jeff, what if you changed your identity to say, 
who am I? I belong to Jesus. Then giving to Jesus is never a burden. It's a joy. Now, Jesus went one step beyond all this when he said, well, why don't you just let God teach you how to be generous? He put it this way in Luke. He said, give and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, pouring over. It'll be poured into your lap. For with the measure that you use, it'll be measured to you. Now, as a young Christian, I said, okay, I got it, God. With the measure I use, it'll be measured to you. So I got out my giving spoon. And I said, okay, God, I want to give to you. Now, Lord, bless me. And God said, may I have your spoon, please? You want my spoon? Yeah, may I use your spoon? All right. There you go. Congratulations. Now, God, I know you've got more than that. He said, I, I know, but I just have your spoon. For with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. That prompts people to get a bigger spoon. <laughs> Not in the sense of manipulating God, but saying, okay, God, I think I understand that you're trying to teach me to be generous of my time with others and of my life. And sure enough, the faithful God says, hey, hand me that spoon. And I say, okay, there it is, Lord. You move on in life and you say, you know what? I think I need a bigger spoon. Oh, yeah, I enjoy God pouring back into my life. But let me tell you what, it is so fun to be able to give when you're doing it, recognizing that I'm getting for a moment to mimic God. I'm getting to play God. Now, normally we say, oh, you can't play God. He said, well, yeah, you, you can. I guess if you get a bigger spoon, I can say, all right, Lord. I, I want to trust you, and so I'm going to give in a way that says, all right, I just trust in you, Lord, with the measure you give, and God says, yeah, and, and hand me that spoon. Now, I don't know where you are in life, and I guess there have been moments in my life when I thought, that's a big spoon. But then I realized that that is really not that big a spoon. And I needed to see somebody else who said, no, 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 that's not a big spoon. That's a big spoon. There have been folks in this congregation over the years who have showed me the size of a spoon. Who have been willing to say, you know what, I just trust God. One of them gave a testimony the other evening at our setters gathering where they said, times when I didn't trust God, yeah, God said, okay, here, you got that, you got your little spoon back out, don't you? <laughs> now, this is, a, this is a thing that causes some of us to be uncomfortable because we say, now, God is not like a Coke machine where you go up and say, okay, I'm going to put my gift in, God, cha-chink, it's going to fall out. Not at all. But, folks, I didn't write that. Jesus did. Jesus spoke it. He's wanting to teach me to enjoy the process of trusting him. And I suppose he's wanting to get me to the place where I say, Lord, I believe in you so much that this spoon just isn't big enough anymore. About the time I think I know what big is, God pours so many blessings into my life that I think, my goodness, I do not deserve how good you've been to me. And the whole church said, Amen. Amen. So what size is your spoon? Paul would say, you're asking the wrong question, Jeff. Just ask, how good has God been to you? I love the way a world-famous Christian man and a quite a good football coach put it. His name is Tony Dungy. Tony, uh, as most of you know, has a couple really nice rings from some championships. But he also has a place in his heart that will forever have a little bit of pain. Tony was to speak at a big Associated Press breakfast. 
and a month and a half before the breakfast, it's the big prayer breakfast that takes place before the Super Bowl, Tony's son committed suicide. Broke his father's heart, stunned many around him, although he had been struggling with addiction and difficulties. The group, family, um, I think it's family bookstores, was actually backing the, the, the prayer breakfast, made an assumption, contacted another speaker, and then sent word to Tony saying, we totally understand if you're not able to speak. And Tony Dungy said, oh, no, 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 I've got to speak. And so he came. I think it's important for us, go ahead and roll it, to know that sometimes... God calls on us to just speak out loud how good he has been to us. So in February, just a few years ago, a Christian man and a hurting father spoke these words. And sometimes pain is the only way that will turn us as kids back to the father. So we've learned a lot about that from my oldest son, James. As you heard, James would have been 19, uh, but he died right before Christmas. James was a Christian, and he was by far the most sensitive, the most compassionate of all our boys. Very, very compassionate, very sensitive. As most teenage boys today, uh, James was getting a lot of messages from the world that, that maybe that's not the way to be. And you've all seen them on TV, in the movies, the music they listen to, the magazines that they're able to read. And you get those conflicting signals and, and mixed signals. And he was struggling very much with how you should respond to the world. And he ended up taking his life uh, right before Christmas. And it was tough. It was very, very painful. Uh, but as painful as it was, there were some good things that came out of it. When I was at the funeral, uh, I talked about one of my biggest regrets. James was home for Thanksgiving and uh, was leaving, going back to school and, and going back to work. And it's just a normal process. You don't think about it. I said, hey, I'll see you later. My daughter took him to the airport. We just exchanged a, you know, see you later. And that was the last time I saw him. Talked to him on the phone a lot, uh, but never saw him again. And I shared at the funeral that my biggest regret was that I didn't give him a big hug the very last time I saw him. A guy, I met a guy the next day after the funeral, and he said, you know, I was there, I heard you talking, I took off work today, I called my son, and I said, I'm going to take you to the movies, and we're going to spend some time and go to dinner. I've gotten a lot of letters like that from people who have heard what I said, and said, hey, you brought me a little closer to my son or a little closer to my daughter, and that is a tremendous blessing. We were able to donate uh, some of James' organs uh, to the Organ Donors Program. Got a letter back about two weeks ago that two people had received his corneas and now can see. That has been a tremendous blessing. So all those things have kind of made me realize what God's love is all about. But here's the, the, the biggest part of that. I know in my heart that James's death has affected many people and benefited many people, and that makes me feel better. But I also know this. If God had had a conversation with me and said, I can help some people see I can heal some relationships. I can save some people's lives. I can give some people eternal life. But I have to take your son to do it. You make the choice. I know how I'd have answered that. I'd have said, no, I I'm sorry. As, as great as all that is, I, I don't want to do that. And that's the awesome thing about God. He had that choice, and he said, yes, I'm going to do it 2,000 years ago with his son Jesus on the cross. 
And because he said yes, because he made the choice that, that I wouldn't make as a parent, that's paved the way for us to come back into relationship with him. Holy, loving God, who gave your only son. Father, we don't begin to have a spoon big enough for that. You gave so that we might have, so that we might be able to give the story of the gospel to others. Father, this morning I pray for any here who have never received that great gift from you. Father, who struggle to believe that anyone could love them that much. For anyone here, God, who's never been baptized into Christ, I pray that when we sing this invitation song, Lord, that they would step out and say, I want to cannonball in, not, not about giving of money first, but, Father, about giving their heart and life to you. Lord, I pray for any here who feel like that, God, maybe they've wandered away and they've been hurting. Lord, I pray that when we sing this invitation song, they'd come forward and let you pour the blessing of grace, the grace that Paul commended those men he loved to into their hearts and lives. But Father, may, may for each of us, you send us out from here today knowing how much you've given and Father, being motivated to be people who to our neighbors, who to our family, who to our church are willing to say, God has been so good to me. I want to give my life and love and resources to you. God, may we be half the givers you are. We pray that in Christ's name. And all that agree say, amen. If you've never given your heart and life to Christ, while we stand and while we sing, if you're in need, this front row is open for you. Won't you come?